let's talk about some dynamics. So uh, we're back to our little block here uh, to kind of give us, get, orient us a little bit to where we are in the course. Um, just as a review, uh, where we have been so far, uh, we have looked at uh, kinematics in the particle, you know, for, for particles. That's where we started. All right, so we got that uh, portion that we did right at first. Uh, the next thing that we did is we looked at Newton's second law and how to use that for kinematics, or excuse me, kinetics um, in, you know, in, in the sense for particles or in, you know, for the purpose of uh, analyzing particles. So that's where we've been so far. Uh, where we are going to start today is over here for kinetics for rigid bodies. So there's, imagine this is like a foundational piece that goes underneath all of those little blocks on the back part of the diagram, okay? Everything that we do for bodies that are bigger than just particles, everything that we do um, relies on us being able to handle uh, kinematics for those bodies that are larger. And so that's, we're starting with that today. And uh, the idea there is that we have to deal with both translational effects as well as rotational effects. So we're essentially adding on uh, rotational effects to the translation that we've already studied. Because pretty much everything that we've done so far um, uh, with respect to kinematics has all been translation because the idea of rotation necessitates that you have something that's larger than a particle. Okay, so that's where we're going today is looking at kinematics for rigid bodies. And from there we will move on um, later, not today, but from there we'll move on and start looking at kinetics for rigid bodies. And then after that we'll get into some of these other uh, methods that we can also use uh, instead of Newton's second law. All right, so uh, one of the things it talks about uh, in this chapter is the idea of translational motion. And the idea with translational motion is that if you have a body that has some size to it, if you're dealing with pure translation, all of the points, all of the little particles that compose that bigger body, they all trace the same path as the body moves, okay? So I'm showing two different options there as far as how that can happen. On the left, you see rectilinear. That basically means all straight lines if it's moving, okay? On the, the next one there says curvilinear. Linear. That basically means that it can move through a curve, but as it does, the body uh, maintains its um, rotational orientation where it started. And what you can say about either of these cases is that if you define a little vector, let's say, and I'm a, I'll do it right here, okay? You define a little vector right there, um, and you imagine that one of these points is A and one of them is B, right? And you look at how this thing moves, you can think of that vector as the position of B relative to A. And what you'll see is that that vector doesn't change regardless of which of these things you look at. That is going to be the same exact vector uh, as you move from one case to the other to the other, okay? And so where we had our equation that we, you know, looked at a while back is that, you know, the position of A is equal to the position of B plus the position of uh, A relative to B. <clears throat> All right. What you see there is that since, you know, as the thing moves, that position of A relative to B or B relative to A, it doesn't matter which way you go, but that relative position vector doesn't change as you move through time. And so if you take the derivative, it allows you to say that the velocity of A is equal to the velocity of B, and the acceleration of A is equal to the acceleration of B. Okay. And I'm kind of beating this to death, but this is kind of the basis that we start with whenever we're looking at the idea of rotation. First, we have to understand really what we mean by translation uh, before we can really sort of understand the idea of rotation. Same goes over here. You can draw a little vector in each of these cases, and that vector doesn't change as you move through space, all right? It, it maintains the same uh, orientation, and so you end up with those conclusions.
So here's the kind of the big picture things I want to say about this. If you have pure translational motion, it means that functionally how you analyze it is no different than if it's a particle. So I'll put here, it works just like a particle. Okay, and therefore everything that we've studied up till now will still apply. As a matter of fact, uh, we didn't have a lot of reason to talk about it early on, but you guys did problems already where we were dealing with bodies that were larger than a particle, uh, but we were able to use our techniques that we um, have defined up till now by doing either you know, one of a few things. We could either say neglect the rotational effects and pretend like that's not a thing, right? So that's one way you can deal with it. You can deal with it by it being pure translational motion, then it doesn't matter, even if it does. You know, there is no rotational effect to ignore, basically. Um, you know, so those are, those are ways that we could ignore the rotational side and use all the techniques that we've looked at up till now. All right. Um, and then the other thing that I'll say about this is that all the equations that we've used up till now, the calculus equations that basically relate uh, displacement and velocity and acceleration, uh, those equations basically all apply to points. So I'll put that here, the equations apply to individual points. Okay, and I'm gonna contrast that with rotation here in just a second, but uh, the equations that we deal with whenever we're looking at, at uh, all the equations we've looked up till now, they apply to individual points, um, and we just so happen, if we have pure translational motion, each of those points traces the same path, and so it ends up, you know, you can, you can sort of do it once and for all with one equation for a bunch of uh, pieces of, it, of material because they're all tracing the same path. So anyway, I feel like I've beaten that one uh, to death. Let's look at a more general case. Okay, and your book talks about this just a little bit. A more general case is if you look at a body um, and you, you can notice that in real life a body doesn't have to just translate, it can translate and rotate, right? So generally speaking, something can translate and rotate. I'm showing, showing here a 2D example. This is actually completely you know, expand, expandable to 3D as well. You can actually take a body and uh, it can move, translate in three dimensions and rotate in three dimensions as well. When we do that, one of the easiest ways to analyze it is by breaking it into pieces. So uh, where one piece is a translational piece, and you kind of think about uh, the movement of the body from one place to another. A lot of times we will look at the center of gravity of the body and how it moves from one location to another. And we'll deal with that as a translational piece. And then we add to that a rotational piece. Say not only did it translate, it also rotated. And we can deal with those two parts of the problem separately. So we'll probably get there uh, pretty soon. But today, my big focus that I wanna do is start to look at the issue of rotation. And the easiest way to look at rotation is actually a third category that is a very common one, and that is pure rotation, or sometimes this is called fixed axis rotation. It's another thing that this is a lot of times called. So you see there, um, that body that I'm showing right there has an axis around which it is allowed to rotate, and it is not allowed to translate. So that means that just by virtue of that constraint that I'm applying, we are saying that it cannot translate or that middle point can't translate. Having said that, any of the individual points that make up this rigid body, they are translating, right? If you look at, let's say, the little point that I applied out here, this little guy, that point, if I was to rotate the body, that point will translate, right? And so this brings up that uh, you know, distinctive point about pure rotation versus translation. When we deal with equations for pure rotation, we are dealing with uh, larger groups of points. So this applies to, at the very least, a line. So I'll maybe say applies to a line minimally. But often, 
a, you know, a body where the body can have much uh, bigger size than just being maybe a straight line. Okay. And here's what we mean by, by rotation. This is stuff that you're already familiar with, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But what we mean is that if you take a point, like this little uh, point that I identified out here, you can actually track that point, and you can look at an angle through which that point moves. Okay, And I'm just going to call that angle theta. Okay, So it started out in one location move to another location through this uh, angle theta. All right. And there's a few things that we can say uh, mathematically about this. I'm, I'm not going to spend a ton of time rederiving these, but I will say that we have uh, analogies between this kind of motion and the linear motion that we have already dealt with. So uh, first of all, I'll say that theta here this is called angular displacement. So just like the linear displacement that we've dealt with before, uh, this theta is an angular displacement. Uh, as a thing that goes along with angular displacement is another thing, and we're going to give it the variable of omega, which we've already used in here a couple of times, but now we're formally defining this. Omega is the rate of change, time rate of change of theta, or if you want to call this theta dot. Okay, and this is called an angular velocity. Okay, so what we're doing there is we're taking the time rate of change of theta and we're calling that angular velocity, uh, which can also be known as theta dot. All right, the next one we'll do is, we'll call it alpha. This is an angular acceleration. Alpha is the time rate of change of omega. Another way of saying that, it's the second derivative of theta. Or another way to abbreviate that is with a theta double dot or an omega dot. All right, these are all equivalent ways of saying the same thing or writing the same thing. Okay, and this is angular acceleration. All right. Um, so that's that's kind of the basic idea because these are so similar to the variables that we would have called uh, in our previous uh, analyses that we've done, we would have called it, you know, a displacement S or a velocity V, uh, acceleration A, right? All the math basically works the same as those. Now we're dealing with angles rather than a translational effect, okay? And that's what I have down here. The calculus works just like our translational Things. And so just as a couple of examples here, uh, for instance, if you take um, the integral of acceleration, of angular acceleration as a function of t, and you take that integral over a specified time period and add to it an initial angular velocity, that's how you get an angular velocity at another time. Okay? That's very analogous to another equation that we've already dealt with where we had, for instance, v of t uh, being equal to the integral from 0 to t of a of t dt plus an initial velocity, right? So I won't spend time and write all those out again because they all kind of work the same way. I will mention one real quick because this, this is interesting. Um, this is the one that uh, a lot of folks have trouble remembering because it doesn't necessarily fit the same form as the other ones that we're used to, but where we look at the change in the squares between your initial angular velocity and a final angle, angle of velocity, one half of that is equal to an integral from zero to theta of 
your angular acceleration as a function of theta, d theta. This one is uh, a good one to know because it's sometimes you're, you don't know the exact time frame over which an acceleration event happened. Rather, you know how far it moved through that acceleration event. And this is a handy type of equation to use for that. And that's analogous to another one that we have already looked at that is, you know, basically the velocity version of that same thing. <clears throat> like this. <clears throat> Okay, so you see each of these equations has an, has an analogy. And so for that reason, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time kind of rederiving these. What I would like to do though, is go up here and talk about a couple of um, parameters that, that matter to us with respect to this motion. So uh, what we've just established is that we can have an angular velocity, you know, omega of this thing we can have an angular acceleration also. So I'll put that on here as well, alpha. Those relate to the actual instantaneous linear velocities of the points on the body. Okay, so velocities and acceleration. So um, like if I wanna know the velocity of this point, for instance, okay. Um, the velocity of this point is just going to be equal to omega r where r is how far the point is away from the center of rotation, okay? And all this stuff really mirrors very heavily the derivations that we did for polar coordinates earlier, right? It's the same stuff because we were just looking at angular motion, but it was a particle, you know, out at, out at some radius and it was the particle moving around. This is really the same thing. We're just looking at a particle that's part of another body. And so we can say that that V is gonna be equal to omega R. Uh, the other thing we can say is that there will be a normal uh, component of acceleration, okay? That acceleration is going to be uh, omega squared R, okay, toward the center. All right, um, there's another component that we should probably be aware of, and it is this acceleration in this direction, and that acceleration is going to be equal to just your angular acceleration times the radius. All right, let's see here. What we wanna do next is we wanna talk through the idea that that problem that I just showed you, or that example where I had a body that was attached to a fixed axis in a 2D case like that, those are very easy to visualize. And so we don't have to necessarily use a lot of vector notation when we're doing that kind of a problem. There's another kind of problem though where it becomes a lot more difficult to visualize. And so I wanted to go ahead and give you all these equations to use for a case where we have a 3D uh, problem or something like this where it's a lot harder to visualize. So first let me describe what I have on this picture. Um, the green line that we have right over here, imagine that that's an axis of rotation. And I, I put it next to this cube so that you could see that um, basically this axis is not necessarily aligned with any particular axis that I'm given X, Y, or Z or whatever. It's some arbitrary thing, maybe it pierces through uh, the, the body that, that that, you know, axis is applied to. One way that you might know that this would happen this way is if I had a ball joint, let's say right here, that was constraining that point back there from rotation, and I had another ball joint right here, let's say, that was constraining uh, that point to where it could only rotate, right? That's what a ball joint does is constrain it to where it only can rotate. Um, well, then I would know that that's the axis of rotation that I would have to have for this body. Okay, so these little guys right here, these are ball joints. And let's say that I know 
um, because of the geometry of those ball joints, I know that I can set up a vector for omega and a vector for alpha. And these are, happen according to the right hand rule. So if I show that vector, let's say for omega sticking up out of there, what that means is that the actual rotation happens according to this right hand rule, meaning it's going around that way. Does that make sense? You wrap your, you point your thumb in the direction of the vector and whichever of your right hand and whichever direction your fingers wrap, that's the direction that it's going to want to rotate. Okay. So I can define a rotation about some arbitrary axis um, as a vector where that vector basically is along a line that extends between the two points. All right, so far so good. And then the magnitude of it would refer to how fast it's spinning. All right, so that's, that's my vector. And then uh, I can also, if I want to know, for instance, the speed that a particular point in the body might be moving, uh, all I have to do is define a uh, position vector. The book actually refers to this as R sub P, like this. You, all you got to do is take a, uh, a vector like this relative to any point that you want to along that line. And that refers to this um, kind of the position of that point of interest where you're trying to find things like acceleration or velocity. All right. So once you've defined these things and you want to know what is the velocity of that point. All right. The velocity of that point is just going to be equal to the cross product of omega and r sub p. One of the reasons they use this little sub p on here is that another thing that is defined elsewhere in the same section in your book is another radius that instead of being free to be selected anywhere along that axis for the starting point, they specify and they say there's another vector that they call simply r that is set up so that it is perpendicular to that axis of rotation. Does that make sense? That's a unique vector. So where they refer to r in the text without this little sub p, usually what they're referring to is that perpendicular vector to that axis of rotation, whereas r sub p is free you don't have to start at any particular location for the starting point of that vector. It can be anywhere along that line. All right. And that velocity can be found with omega cross r sub p. The other one that's, a, you know, really cool and kind of interesting is the one for acceleration. All right. The acceleration of that point of interest is going to be equal to the cross product of alpha and r sub p. But then to this, we add this uh, actually kind of sort of per peculiar um, set of, of computations, omega cross omega cross r sub p. Okay, and when they do the vector math of that, it ends up giving you the acceleration of that point. Um, that acceleration is the centripetal component, right? Whenever you have something spinning, there's an acceleration component that points inward toward the center of, of uh, the path or the center of curvature. And that's what you're getting with that omega cross omega cross r sub p. Okay? Um, there's another one that's, if you happen to know um, that distance that I was talking about, the, the plane r, that I referred to up here, this, this R that goes perpendicular to that line, you can actually change this expression a little bit and it becomes a little bit more simple. It's basically just your alpha vector crossed into that R vector. Remember for this R, that R is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And to this we subtract the scalar value of omega squared uh, times just that R vector, which makes sense because that R vector is already positioned perpendicular to the axis of rotation. All right. So these are some useful equations that they have listed in the book. Um, and, you know, at this point, all I'm really trying to get us comfortable with is the idea that we can determine velocity and acceleration of any point 
within a rigid body that has fixed axis rotation, even if that axis is kind of uh, complicated. All right, questions yet at this point? Excellent, let's do an example problem. All right, here we have a rectangular prism, and we know the dimensions of this rectangular prism, all right? It's uh, in the y direction there, it's eight inches. In the x direction, it's six inches. In the z direction, it's eight inches. So this is a rigid body. All the points stay relative to each other in fixed locations. Um, and we're gonna set it up so that it rotates on two ball joints, one at point A and one at point B on the corners of this rectangular prism. We'll say that the body is, is given an angular velocity of two radians per second and an angular acceleration of five radian per second squared. And the direction of that is going to be defined by a vector extending from A to B. So what that means is that when I define these, uh, you know, angular velocity and acceleration, I can show a vector on here like this, right? What does that mean as far as the direction it's rotating for velocity, let's say? What direction is that velocity? Okay, use your right hand rule, stick your thumb down the X axis, your fingers will, will curl from the Y to the Z, right? That's the direction that we are saying it is spinning. Does that make sense? So it's spinning basically up this way. All right, and I'm not changing it uh, for acceleration. So acceleration works the same way to where that's the direction of the positive. In other words, if you have a, an acceleration um, it is going to be picking up speed in the direction that it is already moving, okay? All right, and what we're supposed to do here is to find the velocity and acceleration components of point C right here at this instant where it's in this position, all right? That's our part one. The next part is we're gonna find the angular velocity after this has been going on for two seconds. Uh, additionally to that, we're going to figure out how far point E has traveled in that time. So in other words, if you were riding on point E, how far would it have felt like you went, right, if you were riding on point E? Not a straight line distance, the distance it actually traced as it went through its path. All right, and then lastly, we're going to change the problem up a little bit for that third part we're gonna, instead of taking that ball joint at B, we're gonna remove that one and instead apply it at D. And once we do that, we'll apply the same omega and alpha uh, about a vector that would extend from A to D. And once we do that, we will find uh, the velocity and acceleration vectors of point E at that instant. Sound good? All right, so let's Start with that first part, the velocity and acceleration components of point C at this instant. V and A of point C. All right, so I'm starting with a relatively easy one, okay? The reason it's relatively easy is that it is easy to see what the perpendicular line is to the axis of rotation, right? There's a perpendicular line that extends from the axis of rotation out to point C. Do you agree with that? And therefore, uh, because we know that's the perpendicular line, we know that the velocity of point C is perpendicular to that line, okay? Or another way to say that, is that that is in the z direction, okay? So where I find my v vector for point C, all I have to do is take my omega term, which was two radians per second, and multiply it by the length of that little red line that I put right there. That is the, the length from A to C, all right? So that length is eight inches. 
okay? And I'd figured out the direction of it sort of separately. I said it was in the z direction, so I'm gonna apply a unit vector of k on there. Okay, and so this just turns out to be 16 inches per second. Okay. Nice little warm up. All right, but what about acceleration? Okay. Acceleration's also not too bad because ex do we have, but we have two components rather than just one. So we have one that's sort of in a tangential direction, right? So that acceleration um, that happens there is in the direction of actual motion. And then we also have a normal component of acceleration that moves to the inward point because of centripetal acceleration, okay? And because all those directions are easy to visualize, we can literally just put in here um, that we have alpha, I'll go ahead and say it this way, we have alpha r um, in what direction? Well, it's gonna be in the k direction. All right, and then in the normal direction, that is in the negative y, right? So I'll put negative uh, omega squared r uh, and then J, okay? So we go ahead and plug in these values. Alpha was five radians per second squared. R is eight inches, okay? And that gets multiplied by K minus omega was two radians per second. That gets squared, multiplied by that radius value of eight inches, and then multiplied by J. All right, so if we simplify this out, I believe that turns out to be 40 uh, inches per second squared, okay, minus, here we've got four times eight would be 32, inches per second squared J. All right, so we've, we've finished up the first easy part there. Next, we're going to look at, instead of an instantaneous type of, type of a problem and looking at what is happening right here at this instant, which is what I just did, now we're gonna look at the same issue where we've got A to B, you know, so the AB rotation axis, but now we're gonna look at this angular acceleration of five radian per second squared and figure out what the new angular velocity is gonna be after two seconds, okay? So what I'm really doing here is I'm gonna have to determine what my omega is and how much angle I have moved through uh, in order to get how far I have moved, right? So omega and theta at time equals to two seconds. That's what I'm doing in this next piece. All right, now the nice thing about this is when you have a constant acceleration, there are beautiful equations for you to use that are list listed in the book. So I would point you to equations 16.5 um, through 16.7. Uh, That's on page 323. Okay. These are only valid for constant angular acceleration. So I'll put that up here. Okay. Uh, 
that's a necessary constraint of on those on those equations. But that's what we have here, so we can use them without any issues. All right. So um, equation, I believe, I don't remember what the numbers were, but one of these equations is that an omega is going to be equal to alpha t plus an initial omega. So an angular velocity after some period of time is equal to the initial velocity, angular velocity plus acceleration times the time. Okay? So we have alpha being 5 radians per second squared times 2 seconds plus the velocity at the very beginning, like where it's shown initially, was already 2 radians per second. Okay, and so what this ends up giving me is 12 radians per second. So that part wasn't too bad either. All right, now this one's just a little bit trickier, but not too bad. There's another equation for uh, the amount of angle through which it moves. And it is just going to be equal to one half of alpha times t squared plus my initial angular velocity times t plus if we have an initial uh, angular position, we can add that in as well. All right, but for us, we're assuming that our initial angular position is just zero for this problem. All right, so what we're going to do is plug in one half. Alpha was five radians per second squared. T is two seconds squared plus, okay, my initial uh, velocity there was two radians per second times two seconds. All right. And so when I plug those in, so this would end up being five times four would be 20 divided by two would be 10. And then here we have four. So it looks like that turns out to be 14 radians. But that's not quite what it asked for, right? What did it ask for instead? It said, how far has point E traveled in that amount of time? All right. So again, we go back to the definition of what a radian is, right? A radian measure is basically arc length over radius. So if you want arc length, which is kind of what we want here, arc length is how far we moved, we take radius and multiply by radians, right? and that gives us an amount that we moved. And so, um, you know, I'll just say distance there at two seconds is just going to be equal to 14 radians multiplied by the radius. And the radius, um, this, is, this does get just a little bit more tricky here. Does it ask for point C or for point E? Right? I ask there in that second question, not about point C, but about point E. What's the radius to point E? It'll be the square root of 8 squared, 8 inches squared, plus 4 inches squared. Okay. So I'm going to plug that in right here. Square root of 8 inches 
squared plus 4 inches squared. All right. So then we plug this in the calculator. And we put in 14 times the square root of 8 squared plus 4 squared. 125.22 units is a radian even a unit okay we say radians just to be clear we're talking about angle but technically it doesn't have any dimensionality attached to it because it is defined as a length over a length right so radians is unitless what comes out of the square root there is in inches. And so this is 125.22 inches. <clears throat> All right. So now we figured out how far point E moved as it went through that motion that we just figured out. All right. Now the interesting part. I actually really love this this particular part because it allows us to uh, get the most out of our calculator all right which I like to do that anytime I can figure out a way to use tools that are allowed to me to make my life easier I like that so what we're doing here for this last part is we're taking this ball joint off of B and we're applying it up here at D. Okay, and we're basically saying there's an axis that extends from A to D, and that's the axis around which this body is spinning. That makes it a little more complicated, doesn't it? Okay. So that's the, uh, that's the axis around which it's spinning, and here it says we're supposed to find um, the velocity and acceleration of point E at this instant, all right? And that's actually not uh, a hard vector for us to find, right? As a matter of fact, it's the thing I just drew on here. There's a vector that I could extend, say, from A to E, and I could call this R sub P, right? But the other one that I've got is this vector that goes from A to D. Maybe I'll do that in a different color here. All right, there's another uh, axis around which this thing spins, and it goes from A to D. All right. So I'll say here um, for A, D, uh, rotational axis I'm gonna do VE and acceleration of E all right and remember that when we're doing this the velocity vector is equal to omega crossed into r. Okay, so we just need to figure out our omega and our r so that we can do this. So let's start with omega. We know the magnitude of omega, right? But we don't know the components of omega until we actually work on it, right? So the way we get the uh, the way we get the components is you take the overall magnitude, which was 2 radians per second listed up there. And that was right up here, right? <clears throat> and what you multiply by is a fraction where in the denominator of the fraction, you put the physical length from A to D. All right, 
which is just the square root uh, of, and I'm going to drop the units because the units actually end up canceling anyway, but of 6 inches squared plus 8 inches squared plus 4 inches squared. And in the numerator, you take each of the pieces, uh, you know, the kind of each of the directions there, like for instance, 6 inches goes in the x direction. We take 6 and multiply it by the component i, or the unit vector i. Um, you know, in the y direction, right, that's 8 inches, right? So I add 8j uh, plus, and in the z direction, I've got 4k. Okay. What I'm doing there is basically uh, using the geometry that I know of the problem so that I end up making a uh, angular velocity vector that has the right length, right, and also the right components. All right, so let me go ahead and punch these in here real quick. I've got, uh, for the first component, I've got 2 times 6 divided by the square root of 6 squared plus 8 squ squared plus 4 squared, which gives me 1.1142, okay, radians per second, I'll leave that off though, I'll just say this is times i, and we'll take all of these pieces and say that they are going to be radians per second, okay, what do I need to change to get j? All I got to do is go in here and change 6 out for 8. 1.4856, we'll say. J plus. Change this out again now for 4. 0.7428. All right, now what about R? Okay. Ours is an R sub P, right? Meaning that it's not necessarily a vector that's perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Um, but it's just a general point anywhere on that axis of rotation. What is this vector for us? Looks to me like it's going to be uh, 8J plus 4. Okay. Inches. All right, and in case you haven't seen this before, um, your calculator has really nice tools built into it. All right, so this is something I definitely recommend that you get used to using. So let me just show you this. Um, if you go to mode, you can put your calculator in vector mode. The first thing it asks you here is, do you want to put some data in for one of your vectors? Sounds good. Um, let me call, uh, I'm going to save vector A for acceleration because that just makes sense. Let me use, uh, for the radius, I'll use vector B. It is going to be a three component vector where I have zero for the I component, uh, eight for the J component, and four for the K component. Now here's the strangest uh, keystroke for you to get used to, is once you get to this point, you have to hit AC to get back to, you know, doing something else. So you hit AC. The next thing you need to do is go back into the vector menu, 
you hit Shift-5 to get into the vector menu. Here's another place where it's tempting to say, oh, I wanted to find another vector, so let me pick something like 3 or 4 or 5 to get vector A, B, or C. That's not what you want to do. What you want to do is go to this one that says data, because that is the one where you actually get to define what your vectors are. And so here, let me say vector C, which is going to be a three component vector. I'm, I'm going to put in omega for this one. So for omega, I've got 1.1142. Here I've got 1.4856. And here I've got 0 0.748. Okay, and now I'm going to hit uh, AC again. Now I have those two vectors stored in the calculator. When you go back into the vector menu again, now you can bring up those vectors. Okay, and if I want to cross omega into R, I'm going to pick the vector first where I have omega stored, which I believe I had that in 5. And to do a cross product, you literally just multiply with the multiplication button. So vector C times vector B. And it will give you an, a result that gives you the velocity of point uh, E in vector form. Okay, so velocity equal omega cross R put it in the Casio, and that ends up giving you uh, zero in the I direction. We'll put it in explicitly so that we don't think it was a mistake. Minus 4.456, okay, and if you want to get more uh, precision there, you'll notice there it actually truncates rather than rounds. So I might actually call that uh, 4.457 J. Okay, and then the next one is positive 8.914. Okay. All right. What should the units be? It ends up being radians per second times inches, right? The radians, remember, is not actually a unit. It's unitless. So this just ends up being inches per second. Shall we interpret these results and see if they make sense? OK. So let's. Imagine there being this rotational effect around this axis, okay? Because I drew the, that rotation as a vector from A to D, right? The direction is in, you know, again, loop your fingers around AD and um, you know, your thumb points in D in the direction of from A to D. You'll see that basically, I guess you would say that point E um, is going to kind of spin to where uh, we're going to have a little bit of negative velocity, right? Because D is elevated above A, that's what creates that negative velocity in the Y, right? Uh, whereas we have a positive velocity component in the J for point E, okay? And even though this might seem kind of counterintuitive, we have zero velocity in the x, okay? The reason for that, one way of interpreting that physically is that you've reached sort of that peak. Um, if you imagine point E swinging around uh, axis AD, you've reached the furthest point to the x, and so now there's zero velocity in the x direction out there. All right. So there is the first part. We found the velocity of point E using this technique in the calculator of taking that cross product. Questions before I move on to acceleration? <laughs>
because this is about to be the coolest thing that I do today, right? This next one. And I've done some cool stuff today, you know, so. All right, for the next one, we'll, we'll work on the acceleration again. And what we have here is we take the alpha vector and cross it into the r sub p vector. And then add on to it omega cross omega cross r sub p. Okay, we already have r sub p, right? And so I, I don't need to do that one again. And I already have a vector for omega, and they're both already stored in my calculator. So the only other thing that I lack before I start using my calculator to evaluate this thing is alpha. How do you think I get alpha? Well, it works just like omega, right? So I get alpha using this same technique. Remember it was five uh, radians per second squared. And we're gonna multiply this by, um, again, the, this, the second half of this remains the same because the vector points in the exact same direction. So it would just be six I plus eight J uh, plus 4k, all divided by 6 squared plus 8 squared plus 4 squared. All right, so 5 times 6 divided by the square root of 6 squared plus eight squared, plus four squared. Two point seven eight five. I, okay, now I'm gonna put in, instead of six, I'll put eight. 3.714 J, and then we'll put in four. So 1.857. Okay. And the units on this are radian per second squared. So let's enter that in as vector A. I'm still in vector mode, by the way, here. So I'll put this in as vector A. Oops, I, I messed up my own advice there. Um, Okay, so what I'll do here is to enter vector A, I have to go to data, not vector A, all right? Then I pick vector A. It'll be a three element vector. And I put in 2.785 and 3.714 and 1.857. All right. Now, order of operations is, uh, you know, important in this. this. is actually a point that I meant to mention, but I didn't talk about it a whole lot. First thing to know is cross products are not, uh, you know, commutative. I guess is the the property where you can actually swap. You know, they are the order of operations actually matters. Which one goes first matters. All right, so you have to do them the order that it says to do them. Um, and so what I wanna show you here is uh, it's probably a good thing for me to go ahead and do an omega cross R first. Okay, so I'll do that one first. Remember I had omega stored in 
vector C. I'm going to cross that into vector B. Okay, vector B there to get that, I put four. This gives me a vector result. Here's what's great. Once you get this vector result, um, it is actually stored automatically in this thing that's called vector answer, right? Let me show you, go back into your vector. Um, see how it says VCTANS? That's stored in there, right? So what I'll do here is I'll actually start on the other end of this equation now and put in vector A for alpha. Okay, so three crossed with um, this vector R, which is in vector B right here. To this, I'm going to add omegas in vector C, right? So I put that in vector C and then here I can take my answer of my previous step. And I need to actually put that multiplication sign right there. And it gives me all of this stuff. So 16.552. go down here. Actually, I'll just do it right here. 16.552. Okay, what are the units going to be? All right. It should be inches per second squared. 16.552i plus or minus 21.07. J plus 17.31. Okay. And until you've done a few cross products by hand, it's, it's <laughs> um, not as easy to appreciate what all we just did just now, but uh, that is a really, really nice feature of the calculator. And so it's one that I highly recommend that you get comfortable with. Either that or get comfortable with doing algebra, because uh, doing cross products is not, I mean, it's not that hard, but it's also kind of tedious. And so having something like this to get it done is really nice. All right, so those are kind of the, the big ideas for right now is how do you look at a rotating body and figure out the uh, velocity or acceleration of any point within the body, um, both for simple cases, which we started out with down here, where you can easily see what that length is perpendicularly to the axis of rotation, and you know what the uh, angular velocity and acceleration are. That's what we started out there or where the geometry gets more complicated and it's important to get it done in vectors rather than um, kind of like looking straight at the geometry. I'll say that almost all of the problems that we encounter in sort of uh, kind of in common use are almost all in that category of being able to see what that perpendicular length is, right? So that's a more common thing, but there are some problems sometimes where it's harder to see uh, the geometry of the relationship between the uh, direction of rotation and the um, position of the point. So, questions? All right, if there's no questions, we will stop there.